I have the antenna currently mounted on a Roan 9H50. That's not going to be its permanent location, but for SWR testing it'll be fine and it's up about 12 feet or so. The feed point for the antenna is at driven element one and you can see there's two nuts with some washers there to keep it in place and you'll need a seven millimeter socket to loosen and tighten these. The assembly manual, which I indicated needed improvement during the build video of the LFA3, continues to offer some confusion, this time on the feed point. There is an illustration here. It shows the inner conductor, or this part of the coax, on the right hand side, and the outer conductor of the coax, or the braid of the coax, to be on the left hand side. But there's no frame of reference as far as where the reflector is located. Is the coax coming in from the center of the antenna or is the coax coming in from the back of the antenna? So what I've decided to do during testing is to reverse these two and try them both ways and see if there's any changes in SWR. I have my trusty rig expert A55 zoom or otherwise known as the Coleco quarterback analyzer ready to go. The feed point is now secured with my RG8 X test cable, so let's see what type of results we get. We're sitting pretty much in the middle of the six meter band, so let's run the sweep. And I'll tell you what, that looks pretty good to me. That's a nice looking curve. The dip is 1.17 at 5688, and that's about 300 kilohertz above the main section of six meters, which right now, as everybody knows, is 5313 the FT8 section where all the DXing takes place. You can certainly do things on six meters above and below that frequency, but that's the key. And that's an SWR curve that's very similar to what I have on my six mic three. And this is right out of the box with following the dimensions recommended by Innova Antennas and the assembly manual, so. Also note there is an absence of the feed line choke during this test. I will be adding a feed line choke when the antenna is raised into the operating position. Given that there was some uncertainty in the assembly manual regarding the placement of the coax leads at the feed point, I've reversed them. I had the red over here and the blue over here, or the inner lead of the coax on this side, and the outer lead over here. Well, I've reversed them, so let's take a look at the SWR now. I wish this had an anti-glare screen, but it doesn't. And almost identical. 5788, but almost identical. Based on my SWR testing, it doesn't appear there's an exact position for the outer and inner conductors to go. You can put them on either side. On my antenna, with this being the reflector, and I realize it's upside down here as far as the writing, I placed my positive or inner conductor of the coax on the right hand side of the boom opposite the mass plate. To assist in future identification of the feed point, I've dolloped a little bit of red paint on the inner lead coax side of driven element one. Keep in mind the antenna's SWR will change as it's raised into the operating position. Being this low to the ground, a lot of factors come into play, including my own presence, which will change the SWR of the antenna. It's George Scott, WA0FSE. I caught him doing actual yard work and responsible stuff, not playing with antennas. Planting tomatoes, lots of beets. I want to pickle beets this fall. So I'm planting lots of beets and hope they grow in these containers I have right here. Time to prep the coax for the feed point and I also want to build a simple coaxial feed line choke. And I have 10 feet of Messi and Poloni's Hyperflex 10. Let's measure this. And Get about two inches or so. You don't want to cut the braid here, and as you can see, I'm now wearing a glove because you don't want to cut yourself. All right, there we go, perfect. Before you solder your lugs on, make sure they're a good fit for your feed point. I just did that off camera, and these are fine, but that's something important to do. If they're too large or too small, you could be screwed. Just tinning up the in before I install the solder lug. Once your lugs are installed, not a bad idea to do a continuity test to make sure none of the braid is touching the center conductor. Okay, that's good. That's good. All right. 
Now for sealing, use a really good high quality black tape or electrical tape. Um, I'm not here to recommend any brands, but I think there's one out there that everybody knows of. And that usually is pretty good. The off-brand black tape, electrical tape, not so good. So you want to go with a real good high quality one. And basically just want to start wrapping these things up until you get to the leads and seal them up as best you can. So it's wrap, 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 and do it a bunch of times. You want this actually rather thick. These two are pretty heavily fortified with black tape now, so I feel pretty good about that. However, I am gonna add some heat shrink. And if you don't have a heat gun, buy one. I'm gonna put some liquid tape on here now, inside here, and I also might try to sneak some in where the lugs are. It doesn't have to look pretty. This isn't a beauty contest. It's a seal your coax so it won't get water in it contest. And in that contest, if you do this, you're going to win. You need something to identify the inner lead of the coax. And red, of course, is the most commonly thought, but I've used, uh, I've used uh, whiteout, actually, I used one time and it lasted. In fact, it lasted 15 years. I'm rather convinced that the sealing that I did on this will outlast this coax. We're going to take this beautifully sealed coax and attach it to the feed point. In order to do that, you do need some metric tools, seven millimeter socket. You want them in there snug. They don't have to be cranked down, but you want them in there snug. Next thing I want to do is I am going to put some liquid tape over this. For the feed line choke, I just went with an air wound design with two turns of the Hyperflex 10. And I chose nine inches in diameter. Why nine? Hmm. Why just two turns? Uh, no. Well, after watching a video presentation by W6NBC, it's excellent, and a link of it will be below. I followed his formula, and it said somewhere around 1.67 turns, so two is actually more than I need. Now, if you want to do more, it can't hurt to have more turns, but if you do, you'll need more than 10 feet of Hyperflex 10. You'll probably need closer to 13 to 15 feet. To secure your choke, don't just use the plastic cable ties. They will break, I guarantee it. I highly recommend Mastrant or something similar in addition to the, uh, the cable ties. It'll last a lot longer. With all that completed, the LFA-3 is ready for install. The LFA-3 is lightweight and easy to handle. However, the boom is 11 feet long. So keep that in mind for your installation. I see the local bird population is already enjoying the antenna. Initially I was going to mount the LFA-3 to a push-up mass, but it's too large for that. So I then chose my mini tower below my Mosley MP33NW. One of the tricky aspects to this install was the mast I was supporting this antenna with already had an antenna existing and the elements of both antennas got tangled up with each other, for lack of a better term. Thankfully, my neighbor, Scott Albrecht, was there to help guide me because I was strapped into the tower, so it was difficult for me to get a good wide view of everything going on, especially when you're that close to the tower and the antenna. Now, Scott helped guide me to the right location, and as you can see, I got the antenna lined up directly underneath the MP33NW. At this stage, I am making sure that the LFA-3 is lined up properly with the MP33NW and the reflectors are both in the same location. The antenna will mount to the mast using the same plate that holds the boom together. The U-bolts require half-inch nuts, so you're going to need a half-inch socket set. So it's right back to imperial measurements for the mounting of the LFA-3. A little bit about safety, not only was I wearing a safety belt when I was on the highest part of the mini tower, I was nowhere near any power lines. I could have thrown the antenna as far as I physically could and still not encountered any power lines. Now that the LFA-3 is mounted, the first thing I'm going to do is check 
the SWR on the Mosley MP33MW, which obviously, as you can see, is right above it. A quick check across the five bands that the MP33NW covers and I see virtually no differences in SWR from the readings I took before I installed the LFA-3. That's not to suggest that the LFA-3 is not going to interfere with the MP33NW. Of course it is. It's only a few feet below it. But it does mean that it didn't drastically affect the MP33NW. And as I've said before, when you DX from the suburbs, everything's a compromise. Gage and Jackson, happy dogs. He wants a Coke. To attach the feed line, I'm going to use a double female barrel connector, as you see right here. I'm going to have to seal this real good, but no big deal. We're running an SWR check here at the feed point. The SWR dip is 1.34 at 58.68. A slightly higher at the all-important FT8 frequency, about there, and it's... 1.71. That QRG of the SWR dip was a little bit too high for me. My amplifiers start showing things in yellow when you get SWRs at 1.7 to 1 and above. So I wanted to lower that QRG. How do you do that? We go back to the manual, adjusting SWR. You take the two loop ends of the driven elements, 1 and 2, and you lengthen or shorten them depending which way you wanted to go. In this case, I needed to lengthen it. It needed to be longer. It was too short. However, the antenna was already in the air. So what was my solution? I climbed back up the mini tower, strapped myself back in, loosened the bolts holding the antenna to the mass plate, and slid the boom closer to me so I could get access to the driven elements. From my position, I could not get at the loop ends, but I could get at the center sections where they met the next element in line with both driven elements one and two. So I reached across with a flathead screwdriver, loosened each one of the four hose clamps, and carefully extended the length of both driven element one and driven element two. That said, it did take several attempts to get an SWR that was acceptable. Because of the wavelength, six meters is quite touchy. So small changes in physical antenna length can lead to big and unwanted changes in SWR. So in the do as I say, not as I do arena, try to make your changes to your six meter antenna on the ground and not in the air. Well, have you ever tried to tune an antenna when it was in the operating position, when it's a Yagi? <laughs> Think I was gonna make it through this project without shedding blood? No. All right, let's check the SWR now. Probably won't even be able to see it. All right, the new dip is 1.28 at 54.08. So that's an improvement of about 400 kilocycles or so. You probably can't see it, but it's so important to have an analyzer at the antenna, at the feed point of the antenna versus in the shack. I'm gonna make sure these are real good and tight, and then I'm gonna seal everything up here. It's double sealed with both high quality electrical tape and self amalgamating tape. This is a bit of a curiosity for me. I have fed my LFA-3 from the center, as you can see here. And then it goes back to the feed line choke and then on to the feed point, which you can see here. However, in the assembly manual, it shows the feed point here at driven element one being fed from the direction of your reflector, which means your coax would be off the side of your beam. To me, it makes a lot more sense to run the coax straight up the mast and over to the feed point at driven element one. Electrically, it probably is not gonna matter either way. I just found this to be kind of a, another curiosity of this assembly manual. Let's send some power through this now. Sorry about the glare, nothing I can do about that. We're sitting at 5305, just below the regular FT8 frequency. And what do we got here? 1100 watts, 1.3 1 to one. A comparison between the SWR measured at the feed point and the SWR measured at the radio shows them very close. So it appears the air wound Chase Elliott feed line choke is working. Now thankfully I did not slide down my roof, but what did was my rig expert antenna analyzer. I set it down here next to the mini tower foot and it just went and fell all the way to the pavement. Smack! the whole time in slow motion. I thought for sure I was out 400 bucks.
There goes $400. Instead, it still works perfectly. Look at that. Credit goes to Rig Expert for a hell of a product here. Kilowatt 4, Whiskey India, contest. Whiskey X Ray, Zero Victoria. Whiskey X Ray? Whiskey X Ray, Zero Victoria. Thank you, 59 Echo Nancy 35. Thanks, QRZ. Thank you, contest, thank you, contest. Whiskey 5 Papa Radio, Whiskey 5 Papa Radio, contest. Whiskey X Ray 0 Victoria. Whiskey X Ray 0 Victor, Echo Lima 29. Thank you. Copy Echo Nancy 35. Thanks, Whiskey 5 Papa Radio, contest. It is rather difficult to get a feel for a new antenna when 6 meters is as poor as it is today, unfortunately for the June VHF contest. A year ago in 2022, the FT8 QRG was filled with loud signals. A year later, well, you can see the scope. I did manage contacts with Alabama, Tennessee, and Texas on CW and phone, but the true test of this antenna will have to wait for another day. The SWR looks good. However, I have to emphasize that good SWR means that you have a nice relationship between the antenna, the feed line, and the radio. It does not necessarily mean you have an effective radiating antenna, especially in a compromised situation such as this. If you're interested in six meters, I cannot give a higher recommendation than this video put out by the Potomac Valley Radio Club. It's called High Performance 6 Meter Yaggies, and it's a presentation by Frank Donovan, W3LPL. It is truly outstanding and absolutely worth the hour and 41 minute running time. A link to this video is found below. I'm not claiming this to be an idyllic 6 meter antenna installation, far from it. Watch W3LPL's video presentation and you'll find multiple rules broken here. That said, let me ask you this. Which antenna makes more contacts? The perfect antenna, which is impossible for you to install, or a compromised antenna, which you can get on the air? That answer is easy. Thank you very much for watching in 73 from Whiskey X-Ray Zero Victoria.